All right, first of all, when we went open source, we explicitly articulated our design axioms for GWT, especially as they apply to the library. So I'd like to start with that and then kind of explain the rest of the features in the library in terms of these, what we call design axioms. Whoops. Uh, first is user experience is primary. If you get one thing out of the, this week, um, I hope that this will be the thing you remember. Um, it, we consider the anti-navel gazing clause. And what I mean is it's really easy when you're working on framework code to kind of get um, caught up in the details about you know, what's, what's wonderful architecture, what's elegant, what's flexible, what's you know, fancy. Um, and the truth is none of that matters if it doesn't produce a good user experience. The subsystems need to be independently useful. So if I use RPC and I don't use any of the UI library, I shouldn't have to know about any of those classes. So that's really important, and we considered our anti-frameworkiness clause. Nobody likes to use those big monolithic frameworks where if you touch you know, one little thing, it like pulls in the world and gets you know, really complicated. You sort of have to learn everything in order to use anything. Um, we want to make it the exact opposite. So you can just use history from GWT, or you can just use RPC, or you can just use the UI, or you can just use Request Builder. Those are important properties. And then uh, a, a little trickier one is to discourage unoptimizable patterns. This is sort of like the first one, but it's really easy when you're writing a, um, a framework to, pull, to kind of overgeneralize things. And typically what happens is you create things that can't be optimized well by the compiler. So knowing what optimizations the compiler can do really well, you have to design APIs in the library such that the, their design doesn't defeat the optimizations. And then, of course, you should only pay for what you use. So if I only call three methods out of 12 on a class, I should only pay for the code that's required by those three methods. Um, it works out really well. So I, I, you might have seen this slide, but what I did here was I started with a blank module, compiled it. There's, it's really tiny. I added one widget, compiled it, noted the size, added another widget, noted the size, and you can see that the size of the compiled script is completely a function of how much code you write, but even better, as, as you use more and more, you sort of get the main working set of code in there. And then each additional class that you add kind of is like increasingly smaller amount of code. But most importantly, it's a function of what you actually use and the code that you write. So then this is what I'm calling the essence of GWT. And I, it's important to distinguish between really what we consider GWT versus the libraries. So here are the core things you should know about GWT. Hosted mode. The class here is GWT shell. When you run um, in hosted, hosted mode, you'll see the tree logger and you'll see the hosted browser. That's the debugging mode. Web mode is the GWT compiler. That's what compiles modules into JavaScript. Deferred binding subsystem, um, hopefully you were able to see that talk and hopefully you're aware of that now. That's one of the core facilities um, underlying everything in GWT. And then there's a small bit of magic in GWT user.jar and that's what I want to outline. It's easy, to, it's easy to create a framework where there's like this set of um, elite people who know how it works, and you can only use that library, but you can't sort of build your own things in terms of it, because it's either you know, obscure or too complicated or whatever. We wanted to make sure that we only use really tricky things like in, in very, very small quantities, and then built up everything else in terms of those things that are well-defined. So in other words, we tried to eat our own dog food with the libraries instead of making a bunch of special purpose things. So those sorts of tricky magic things, JavaScript native interface, um, the gwt.create call, this is the entry point for deferred binding. This is the, the junction point where you create permutations. Uh, this is the junction point where you can run code generators. Why does it require class literal? We'll come back to that point, but remember that it does. So when you say gwt.create, the argument cannot be a variable. It has to be a class literal. The JavaScript object class, it is special. As you'll see if you read the java.comments, it says, you know, careful, 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 careful. Like there's only certain ways you want to interact with this. I'll come back to the specifics of JavaScript object in a moment, but everything else is written in terms of these. GWT is not its libraries. The reason I called out those, those points in the previous slide, that is what GWT is. Now, we have a lot of libraries, but we consider them value add. Again, not anything magical. You can, for example, patch them. You can copy, make changes, put it, prioritize it in your class path, 
and the compiler will happily use that version. Hosted mode will happily use that version. So you never have to be stuck waiting on a new GWT release just because there's one little bug. You can also, in theory, support a new browser yourself. And it's, believe it or not, it's actually pretty straightforward. Hopefully, um, <laughs> there won't be yet another browser variation. But it's interesting to say what, what would happen if this did occur. Um, the deferred binding subsystem is completely open and configurable. So you would use the extend property um, uh, element in your uh, module XML file to add an additional value for user agent. And then you create a subclass of DOM impl. And then you just basically fill in the blank. So as, long, as soon as you implement DOM impl, all the widgets are written in terms of the DOM abstraction. And then you get the, an extra permutation that's totally optimized for this new browser. So it's more of a litmus test of did we design it right? Could you create your own browser um, adaptation? And the answer is you could. Also really important is you can not like the libraries, but that doesn't mean you have to not like GWT. I mean, sure, the libraries are a really important part of it. But it, it, we do see people sometimes say, I don't like the way this widget works in GWT. My answer to them is maybe you, you should get the other 95% of the value out of GWT and just write your own version of that widget. You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, basically. So GWT user.jar is where all this stuff lives. You want this in your build path when you are writing code. It contains the JRE emulation library. It contains the core WIT classes that have like the magic stuff I was talking about before. It contains all the other value add libraries, UI, RPC, and history that I'm going to talk about momentarily. One thing we did for convenience is we actually added the servlet interfaces, um, uh, HTTP servlet. I think it's, is that right? HTTP, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Um, but we added those to GWT user.jar. But like uh, servlet containers won't load the jars that define those interfaces. So that's what GWT servlet.jar is for. So basically, when you deploy into a servlet container, just switch out GWT user for GWT servlet.jar. The alternative would have been to basically <laughs> force you to add yet another jar to your build path just to get up and going with GWT. We just felt like that was an annoyance people didn't want to deal with. OK, JRE emulation. So uh, the first question people ask is, what's there in the JRE emulation? And the answer is, go to this page. I mean, the source code is all there, too, of course. But this is just a list for things that you actually you know, want to you double check what classes are there, what methods are there. All these are hyperlinks to the official JRE documentation. So that's on the GWT website on Google Code. The second question people ask, and they get pretty concerned about this before they hear the answer, how do I know what I can and can't use? It seems like a minefield um, of, you know, of unknown things that are available. Because really, nobody's going to look at that page I just showed you before they write code. They're going to write code. Um, and fortunately, the answer is it won't run in hosted mode even. So basically, the only way you can accidentally use JRE classes that won't actually translate, that aren't available in GWT, is if you never actually run the code at all. So I mean, if you're the kind of programmer who sits down and writes 30,000 lines of code and then tries to run it for the first time, you're the one who might encounter this problem. As long as you run it in hosted mode, as long as you like debug, um, you'll be fine. If you're debugging it, then you're using the right subset of the JRE. And also, don't get hung up on missing features. You can write them yourself. Again, I, I really want to stress this. It's not a black box of functionality. You can easily wire things in yourself. You can add JRE classes and follow the pattern that's there if you really need something. And this happens especially when people are sharing server-side code to the client. There might be a JRE class that's not, not particularly high value, but just for compatibility, you want to have it there. Um, so you can do that yourself. Now, the GWT class is really special. You've got dependency injection in GWT. We don't really talk about it that way because we're sort of averse to buzzwords, but that is what it is. The DOM uh, impl class, for example, um, uses this to, to do cross-browser support. So I said before, GWT.create has to have a class literal as its argument. The reason that is is because the compiler literally transforms that method call into an, a construction expression, instantiation expression. So in this example, t.class 
fans out into multiple permutations. In one permutation, it might get replaced with T1, and another, it might get replaced with T2, another T3, or T, in another permutation, it could be T1 again. Um, the point is, you write the Java source code once, you program against a polymorphic supertype, and then the compiler creates permutations where it substitutes in subtypes, and then optimizes knowing which subtype was picked for that permutation. The compiler can't do that nifty trick if the value of the argument to create is a variable. If that is only known at runtime, by definition, the compiler can't do this trick. That's why the rule is the way that it is. You can control the bindings, basically say, replace this class with this other class um, via gwt.xml files. A DOM, the DOM abstraction is a perfect example of this. If you look at the GWT modules for the um, user agent, you'll see things like, or for, for, sorry, for the dom.gwit.xml, it will, you'll see things like um, replace DOM impl with DOM impl IE6 if the user agent is Internet Explorer, and so on. And you get permutations like this, where they're each separately compiled and optimized and linked together all at compile time so that you know that it works and you don't have to do HTTP round trips to get things off the ground. You just do exactly one to fetch it, and then you cache it. That's what gwt.create's all about. Um, in addition, you can do compi uh, uh, compile time code generation. This is how RPC works, image bundle works, localization works, um, and I'll show some examples of APIs that use it um, in the future. You can also write your own um, code generators if you want to. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this, but if you went to raise the deferred binding talk, or if you um, watch the video later, you'll see um, how to do that. A couple of other things on the GWT class that are useful. Get module base URL. This is how you can write um, widgets and things that need to um, find their resources relative to where the module itself was served up from. This is actually a really uh, beneficial thing, especially if you're including scripts cross-site, because normally script tags pull in JavaScript but that JavaScript can't ask the question, where was I served from? So in normal cases, you can't do that when you're handwriting JavaScript. GWT has, in the bootstrap process, we figured out a way to like, record that bit of information. So and basically, if, if you pull in a script from another site, it contains code to fetch an image. It ought to go back to the site that the script itself was served from, right? That's actually extremely tricky you try to handwrite JavaScript code to do that. Um, we just build it in. Um, so when you fetch an image, you prepend, get module base URL. It's guaranteed to end with a, a, a slash unless it's empty, so you can always just uh, append it like that. You don't have to worry about checking to see if it has a slash at the end and so on. There is a method called isScript, so you can sort of ask whether you're, the, <laughs> you're running in web mode or hosted mode, but don't use it. Then there is a last resort exception catching mechanism, because like events, for example, they come in from sort of the ether through the, you know, through the, the, the browser's operating system event loop hooks, comes into the JavaScript code. And so in some cases, if you don't have proper exception handlers, exceptions can propagate back out. But you can either have that really just go back to the browser and you'll, get, you'll see the traditional message that you see in Ajax apps, which is script error like the user would see that, or you can set uncaught exception handler and all of our junction points between the underlying browser and the GWT code has these guards so that it's sort of like a fail-safe place to catch exceptions. The JavaScript object class is important because it is a Java class and it's not JSNI, but it isn't a wrapper for a JavaScript object either. It is a opaque handle that's a representation of the real JavaScript object. If it were a wrapper, that would imply that to create and manipulate elements, you'd be doubling the amount of objects that are represented. So that explains why you don't have methods on it, because Java methods don't necessarily correspond to the methods that are actually on the underlying JavaScript object. However, um, and Joel alluded to this in the previous talk, in the next version of GWT, we have found a way to still give you methods on these opaque objects without adding additional um, runtime inefficiencies or memory consumption. And I think I just lost the slide. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm gonna come back to that uh, in a minute. So internationalization. Okay, you, uh, you might have seen um, Shenzhen's uh, IETNN talk. 
If you didn't, go back and check it out. This is a very superficial discussion of it. GWT has that static um, uh, localization, and it has dynamic localization. The website, I just want to show you where this is, has a questionnaire for you that if you answer these questions, it will tell you what you should pick. It explains the way to do it statically, which is really efficient and avoids errors, or dynamically, which is a lot more flexible and interoperable, but um, is slow and um, a lot less sound. That's the dictionary class. So if you, if you use the dictionary class, you're basically saying, I, the compiled code doesn't really know what the localized strings are. I'm just going to assume that the HTML page from which I'm served contains definitions for these strings. So that way, you, you don't create extra permutations for each locale that you localize for. You just assume that the HTML page defines it. The static approach is, is kind of neat. It uses conventions based on the name of the, the uh, interface or class that match the way that um, you know, like resource bundles work in um, Java. But we do it all at compile time. So it, it, it uses this sort of best match algorithm. So um, if you have a class that is uh, intended to be used in the French Canadian locale, then it'll choose that one if that class is defined. If not, it'll look for the French one. If not, it'll look for a default one. So this manifests in a couple of ways. There's an interface called localizable. And localizable takes the, the matching algorithm that I just mentioned so that any um, type that extends localizable that is named with those suffixes will get selected in preference based on the locale that is current for that page. This may not make a lot of sense. The point, though, is just to let you know about these things so that you can go research it later if it sounds like something that's useful to you. Then there is a way to create um, constants uh, that are essentially like externalized uh, properties but still get compiled in. So it's just like loading a properties file at runtime in Java except that we do it at compile time so that you don't have the extra uh, dynamism that costs you time. You can externalize you know, values, strings, um, even maps, which I'll show an example of in a second. And then you can do templated messages um, uh, which, where you have like placeholders, and then you pass in arguments for those placeholders. Then there's date, time, format, number format for parsing and formatting um, date, times, and numbers. OK. I kept forgetting to do the demo earlier, so did not want to forget again. Um, this is part of the distribution, but I just want to quickly show you what these things look like. So um, number format and date time format use a, a, a string that sort of defines a pattern template. And, and you can use, like, you have to read the Java doc. It's a really sophisticated thing. You can say, like, I want, I want the uh, thousand separator to appear here. I want the decimal point to appear there in a, in a pattern. Although when it gets, actually gets formatted, in your pattern, a period might become a comma, depending on the locale, and vice versa. All those rules are defined for, I think, 400 and something locales right now. It's tricky stuff. I talked about the messages interface. This shows you what a messages interface looks like. We have here um, a, a uh, method defined. And the parameters to this method are, correspond to the placeholders in the message template. So this is the rendered message template. I'm sorry, this, this is the rendered message template. And you can, you can change values here. And that's doing a real-time replacement. Uh, constants, uh, this basically, it's, it's like messages, except it's not intended for parameterized things. It's for intended for like multiple types of things, like doubles or integers, where you want to externalize those sorts of resources from your application. And then you can do something really funky um, that lets you get a map of like basically keys, where the keys are well known to the code. And the keys themselves aren't internationalized, but the mappings, the things that they, those keys map to, are internationalized. Um, and this, in this example, um, the, it, to make it most clear, this list box looks things up by key. And it might ask for you know, GR like, to mean the localized thing that represents the color name gray. So you, co you correlate 
keys within each item in the list box with a localized value. And then there's a variation called constants with lookup, such that you can actually, at runtime, you get a little more dyna dynamism by, you can specify the method name, and you can see that it'll do a lookup of that method name. So the downside of using constants with lookup, and the reason it's called out as a separate um, interface, is that it forces the code generator to create a hash map that essentially causes all those methods to be retained, because it doesn't know what you might use at runtime. So you, it can't do the normal dead code elimination. So use it sparingly. We wanted to add that flexibility, but we pretty much tell people don't use it unless you really have to. OK. So let's uh, totally move on. Um, there's, you can do sort of arbitrary HTTP requests using a class called Request Builder. This is totally separate from RPC. This is great for interacting with RESTful backends or simulating form posts, uh, pretty much whatever you want to do. You just instantiate Request Builder, specify the HTTP method <clears throat> and a URL. And then if it's a post, you can send post data along with it, and you provide a callback. Everything is uh, asynchronous. Sorry about that. You, um, see, you also get, in the request builder, you can configure uh, timeouts and authentication. You know what, I'm just going to hold this for a second. You can configure timeouts and authentication uh, before you actually send it. You can adjust the request headers. And when the result, response comes back, you can examine the HTTP response headers. So it's for pretty much any kind of low-level HTTP uh, interaction that you want to do. Uh, as I said, it's always asynchronous because if you ever try to use the um, XHR, XML HTTP request um, class in JavaScript, you're going to end up with um, a locked up browser that performs horribly. Okay. There is a reason for that. She knows exactly the right angle to put it at. So. Uh, I tried that yesterday and ended up sounding like I was talking in a paper bag. Um, if, you, if you check out the Javadoc for Request Builder, um, you'll see that there is some uh, really nice explanations of the caveats associated with it. Um, they're, they're really fundamental to basically browser programming in general, um, but it, it really explains it. So the same origin policy, the number of outgoing request limit, um, the module you should inherit in order to make it work. Um, it even has a caveat about the fact that you can use other HTTP methods other than get or post, but you have to do this really funky thing in order to make that happen because Safari will break on anything besides those two. So you have, you have to essentially explicitly create an, a subclass of this thing just so you can try to do something that won't be compatible. So in other words, it is possible to kind of do something that won't work on Safari, but you wouldn't stumble onto it. OK, so uh, XML. There's an XML uh, client-side library that's portable. Um, and if it sounds like a given that you get a portable XML DOM um, in JavaScript, think again, because it is th there are very subtle differences across browsers um, interacting with what should be a very standard interface. There are two main ways to use the XML parser class. You can create a blank document and then build up things programmatically, or you can parse um, an XML string and then access the DOM that way. But you get back a, um, you know, a node interface, and you have node lists and all the stuff that you would expect to see based on the um, W3 standard API for that. It works particularly well with, uh, X with Request Builder because the, you, know, you could use Request Builder to, to fetch an XML document, pass it to the XML parser, and you're in business. Then you've got um, JSON, which is very analogous to that. Um, you pass the JSON parser uh, a JSON string, and it creates a data structure for you. Uh, and it tries to do some, some clever things like um, lazy mapping from JSON child objects to their Java equivalents. Um, and I, I didn't call it out here, but, um, or I didn't show it here, but there's a hierarchy of types so that you, you're making sure you're interacting with the JSON structure in a type-safe way. So, for example, there's at the, the, the um, motion abstract class is, is JSON value. Then there are JSON objects, which are things that have named fields. Um, a particular value might be an array, it might be a number, it might be a string. But the API is designed so that you don't accidentally you know, use something as an array when it's really a 
number. It's, it's really easy to do if you're not careful in uh, uh, JavaScript normally, and we try to give you some type safety around that. Again, it works really well with um, the request builder, so you, you fetch JSON in the background and you use the JSON parser. This is great for interrupt. Um, so I mentioned before that we're doing some neat stuff with JavaScript object in the upcoming 1.5 release. And hopefully, we'll get rid of the JSON library altogether uh, with something much more efficient. And this is what it looks like. So in, instead of having to say, you know, parse a JSON string, now I have a JSON uh, value back. Now, is that an object? If it is, OK, great, cast it to an object. So then does it have a field called first name? And if it does, is that a string? And if it is, what's the value of that string? That's kind of how the JSON library has to work today. In 1.5, you can do this. Essentially, you can actually extend JavaScript object, and you can define JSONI methods around structures. So if you were to return something from JSONI called person, the compiler would superimpose this type onto that object. Does that make sense? OK, good. The net result, again, we're not into wrapping things at the low level, because that's not affordable. So, oh yeah, oops, bad animation. So, again, to go back for a second, okay, we have a method called first name, and then we call that method on this person class. The compiler turns it into that. So it, in, it inlines from the JSNI, handwritten JavaScript, all the way back out into the compiled JavaScript. So the, even the existence of the person class goes away completely. So this is pretty cool. We're really excited about this. This basically means you get zero overhead type safety around JavaScript. And you can actually start to write a style of Java that looks a whole lot like JavaScript, but you get code completion and refactoring and type safety and at no additional cost. JSON, as you can see, is really just a special case. Joel talked in the last, uh, in the last talk, the um, UI talk, about we're doing the same thing for element, so we can add methods on element now, which is a subclass of JavaScript object. Yep, like I said. There is a unit testing and benchmarking, um, which is a whole separate section. There's a lot of interesting stuff uh, here. I'd say the best thing to remember about this is that it works with normal JUnit test runners, extend um, with test case or the benchmark uh, class if you're going to do benchmarks. Both benchmarks and test cases can run either in hosted mode, in the case that you're needing to debug them and step through the tests themselves, or in web mode, which means that even within the context of a JUnit test runner, it compiles your Java into JavaScript, runs it in a browser, and reports the errors back to your JUnit test runner. To make that happen, you do dash D. You, it's a, a Java system property you define, dash D, gwit.args equals dash web. Because the JUnit test runner has its own command line arguments, we have to kind of wire, our it, wire ours in through this special wit.args. Um, if, you, if you're in a situation and you want to try this, uh, just ask anybody in the, on the uh, developer forum, and they can explain how to do it. There's also something that's totally not documented, um, but is extremely useful. Um, we just weren't sure that it was going to be right yet. I'm still not sure it is, but we do use it for testing every build. It's called the browser manager server which you can run on across the network on other machines, and it can manage browsers for you. And then you can farm out test cases across the web. So I can, on one machine, run a JUnit test runner and set it up so that it will compile the unit tests into, web, into uh, JavaScript, pass those unit tests to the, um, the browser manager server on another box. It will run in a browser uh, you can configure in any number of different browsers and then assimilate the results and send them back to be reported into your test um, harness. It's really useful stuff. Again, that's one we should probably talk about on the mailing list if you're interested. In GWT 1.5, there's something called set debug ID, which will help with Selenium testing, but has no additional cost in production code. So RPC. Um, I'm going to start going a little faster because these things are pretty well known. RPC lets you send object graphs across the wire. But importantly, it handles cycles, polymorphism. You can even throw exceptions across the wire. 
The coolest thing is you can share class definitions between server-side code and client-side code, so that when you refactor, you're refactoring your client code and server code simultaneously. They're always asynchronous for the same reason that request builder is always asynchronous. But understand about RPC that it is, its purpose is speed, correctness, and productivity for you as a, as a developer. It is not for interop. So we, we don't care about having RPC that can talk to PHP backends. We want the tightest possible coupling between job on the client, job on the server, so that we don't have to compromise anything in the wire format. We make it the small, as smallest and fast as, as it can be. If you need interop, that's what the JSON and XML libraries are for. So this is really documented um, in a lot of places. Um, the, the developer guide explains it in great detail. I won't go to it, but there's a diagram that explains all the moving parts. It's probably one of the first things you'll play with um, if you read a GWT tutorial. Oh, another interesting point is that if you use it sort of the, if you don't use the dash no server option, if you use the embedded Tomcat server built into GWT in hosted mode, you can set breakpoints in client side code, in server side code, and then debug them together easily in one single session, uh, which is really useful. Um, originally, um, this, this mechanism was tied to servlets, but in uh, GWT 1.4, we factored that out so that there's an RPC class that you can use for ad hoc integrations on the back end. So if you get basically a serialized request from the client, you can use the RPC class to crack it open into its object graph, pass that to whatever back end services you want, and then use the same class to re-serialize it to send it back. They use this for, uh, I think Rob Jellinghouse used this for spring integration. Um, I can't remember if I'm properly crediting who did that. I can't remember if that was Rob or uh, Robert Hansen. Anyway. Um, and there's some other crazy things you can do if you really want to get into it. RPC um, creates a client-side serialization proxy, which you can actually get at that if you really want to, which lets you do crazy things, uh, optim optimal things that are a little more advanced, like on the server, you can actually uh, execute the service that you would have made an RPC call for, even when you're serving up the initial HTML page. So if you can imagine, you know what the first RPC call would be that you're going to make anyway from the client. So you just go ahead and make it on the server. Then you take that serialized response, shove it into the HTML that's coming down from the very beginning. Then, then your module loads. Then you reach up, grab that string, deserialize it on the client, and you've just saved an RPC request at startup, which really does make a difference because it makes a difference between load the HTML, load the module, fire off an RPC request, get the results, then show something, versus HTTP comes down, I mean, the HTML page comes down, the Java, the Java source code runs, the data, the answer to the first RPC is already there locally, and then you can do something without doing another HTTP request. I don't know if that made any sense whatsoever. Um, if, if it sounds interesting to you, let's talk about it more online. There's the history class. Um, the thing to remember about history is two things. Um, you get programmatic history control based on the idea of sort of arbitrary little string tokens, and it gives you constant bookmarkability. So if you implement history right, the user should be able to say add bookmark at any meaningful time within the application, and it should work. But it's not magic. It doesn't m somehow magically add, s save the state of your running application or anything like that. You simply have a chance to get events when history changes. When the user clicks back or forward, you get different history tokens, and your app has to be coded such that it does something smart for those history tokens. There's a bunch of other stuff. There's a window object where you can um, set up a, a resize listener. So for um, things like the mail sample, when you resize the browser, it figures out how to relay out. Um, you can use that uh, for that purpose. There's also uh, window.alert if you want to just sort of show dialog boxes. Um, sort of the ugly little dialog box. There's a cookies class where you can get and set cookies. There's a random class, which is essentially the same thing as the Java util random, except it's, it is not nearly as well specified, and it's really fast because it uses the underlying um, JavaScript uh, randomness. Then there's something called timer, which you, pro you might have seen. You essentially can say, uh, call me back and run this command at you know, n milliseconds in the future, which is really useful. And then there's a deferred command. Deferred command is sort of like timer, but the point of deferred command is to say, I know that 
the, the, the browser needs to go back to the event loop before I can do this other thing. And I want to do this other thing as soon as possible, but after the browser has gone back to the event loop. So for example, if I make a bunch of DOM changes, those don't actually appear um, because they don't render until your Java code, JavaScript code finishes. So let's say I make 1,000 DOM manipulation changes, right? Then I want to do some more stuff. The right thing to do is to set up all those. Uh, you can run all, those, uh, sorry, run all the code to do those changes, set up a deferred command so that you exit the JavaScript, the browser renders everything so the user gets feedback, and then it immediately calls back into your other code that executes now that the user has seen this stuff. There's a, another really useful variation of that one called incremental command. If you're doing long-running work, you're constantly fighting um, doing the most you can uh, within JavaScript without having to do a bunch of timeouts. But at the same time, you always run the risk of uh, inducing that slow script warning. Incremental command is a, is a general purpose solution to this. So the idea is you do a tiny bit of work in an incremental command and then just say whether you're done or not. If you can write the incremental command to do that, the, the mechanism will, <laughs> it'll figure out basically how, how much of a time budget you have before it's going to trigger slow script warning, and then call your, your incremental command potentially multiple times, even before it leaves the JavaScript to go back. So in other words, it runs as much as it can without having to go all the way back through the browser event loop. It runs as much as it can without running too much and inducing a slow script warning. Just know that that's there. We can discuss it more online. Then there's the UI stuff. So this entire talk, and we've really only gotten to the UI stuff now. Hopefully, that gives you a sense of how much surface area there is. But then again, the UI stuff is most prominent. You probably need to hear the least about that from me. There's the portable DOM layer. So you don't actually have to use widgets at all. You can just program directly against the DOM if you want to. But if you do want to use the widget library, there's UI object, which is the, the most abstract, um, and it can't handle events. There's widget, which can handle events, but can't contain other widgets. And then there's panels that can. Um, you'll actually encounter their concrete subclasses like tree um, or like doc panel. That is what you'll see. But composite is a really important one to remember, which if you saw Joel's talk, I'm sure he mentioned. Instead of subclassing panels, you really want to be using composite instead. Because if, let's say I have a, uh, an application-specific type I want. Insta if I were to, say, extend vertical panel, my application-specific widget has to sort of honor all the inherited methods from vertical panel. And there's a bunch of junk in there that really doesn't make any sense for my application-specific class. So composite is the answer to that. Composite doesn't have any API, really, that inherits, but it wraps something else. So the idea is you wrap a panel, and it's, not, it's a, only a tiny bit of overhead um, but the benefit is that you get a clean API to your widget, and you don't have to do all the complicated stuff about creating a widget. You can write a widget that's for your app in terms of other panels and widgets without having to get into any of the stuff Joel talked about in the UI talk about how to implement has widgets and, and the complexities of implementing a panel. OK, um, image bundle is really cool. Um, we've been talking a lot about this, so you probably have already seen it. But the idea is you extend the image bundle interface. You define methods that look like this. If, and there should also be um, <coughs> images that are accessible at compile time that have the same names as those methods. And if so, you can then call those methods on your image bundle. And what you get back is an automatic sprite, a CSS sprite that's created. So the net effect is at compile time, it takes all the images that you need in a bundle, smushes them together into one cacheable more efficiently downloaded um, image. And those abstract image prototypes represent, represent rectangles that are clipped properly so that when you show it, you're only getting one portion of the image, even though you get the efficiency of a single download. This is what we call a win, 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 win. You get compile, check, compile time checking of resource URLs so you don't get broken image links due to dynamism at runtime. Run it's a compile error if, you, if there's a mismatch between the image name and the file name. Automatic creation of CSS sprites, which is really tricky to get right, especially on CSS if you want transparency, because don't get me started on alpha transparency support for pings. 
you can change order n requests to order one request. In other words, where something that would have been 30 HTTP requests to fetch 30 different icons can be exactly one request to fetch the strip that contains all the icons. That's huge at startup. You get perfect caching because the bundle names are um, named using an MD5 hash name so that two, the two of them will never be confused with each other. So you can set your cache headers to be, you know, basically cache this permanently, which really aids in startup. And then another neat thing is it prevents what we call, uh, technically speaking, layout jiggliness at startup. Since at compile time we're having to load the images anyway, we can just measure what the width and height are. And so the abstract image prototype leaves, it, it automatically explicitly sizes the slot for that image to the size that the loaded image is going to occupy. So in other words, instead of having a small, uh, you know, sort of that placeholder that gets big and causes everything else to re relay out once it's loaded, you, you have exactly the right spot, so it just kind of pops in. The mail sample shows this. Um, I mentioned implicit layout just now. Things lay out automatically. That's really important for fast um, layout, and also because when you change the font size, you want things to lay out uh, automatically. You've got, you style things with CSS, Check out set style name and um, add style dependent names for that. It helps you manage complex style names together. We want keyboard support for everything, and you'll see that in most everything in the UI library. The result is fast, accessible apps. So last thing I want to show you here is the showcase application, which is, whoops, which is going to be new in quit 1.5. And some people have asked for nicer out-of-the-box styles. This is an example of the simpler of the styles that we're going to do. So that you should be able to just sort of borrow this style um, from the out of the box. Let's see, let me get let me get this all on the screen. So um, the nice thing about this is the way that uh, John LeBanca designed it is um, you can write, you know, so you, you create uh, additional sort of chunks of functionality here, and then it automatically figures out how to correlate what you're demoing with the source code that, to produce it. So in other words, for anything in this list, you can just kind of check out the source code that created it so you can see an example. And then you can see the associated CSS styles. This really, we think, as people play with this, will really help you make a correlation between the widget and the associated styles. Um, and this also has all the different <laughs> all the different widgets, which I probably don't need to go into. You can, soon enough, you'll be able to play with these yourself. Um, is there anything in particular here? Some of the panels, hopefully this will make clearer too. You have a bunch of different approaches to layout here. These are all different constraint-based layouts. We added some additional spots where you can set style names so that you can more easily get Nice looking, like rounded corners on your tabs. If you want to take a look at, the, at this. So each of those is a, is a sort of a well-known logical name that you can write CSS styles against. And all the widgets are, are um, exposed those sorts of names so that pretty much you can plug into <laughs> most any aspect of any widget and control its CSS. I think I've hit the time, like, literally down to the very last second. Absolutely. But just in case, do we, we have time for a 40-second question? I, I see 38 we can, we can, seconds. We can take a couple of short questions. Hi. Um, if we have uh, three or four modules, I asked that question yesterday as well. If you have three or four modules in your one application, do you have any way, like, you know, call gwt.get modules, you know, and interact with those modules and get them access to those methods, you know? Can we do that? Right. So th there, there's really two answers to that question. Um, well, one is really a, one is a, a point that I want to make, and then the other is the answer. To answer your question, the way to do that is to, you can, you can sort of manually create JavaScript APIs from things. So using JSNI, you can assign basically hooks to the window object, and you're explicitly defining entry points back into your module. Because remember, your module is compiled together and obfuscated like crazy. So any two modules that are compiled separately, 
they, they may contain totally different subsets of the library. So the method you want to call may not even exist in the other module. The way to ensure that it does exist is to explicitly publish um, some sort of entry point by using a JSNI method to assign to a well-known, like a well-known uh, function off of the window object. Then you can use JSNI on both, within both modules and you can be sure of what the name is because those won't be obfuscated. And you can be sure that the code that you need will exist because the compiler recognizes when you do this and it makes sure to keep that code around. So basically, in the same way that you would publish a JavaScript API, that's how you can wire together separate modules. The point I wanted to make is there's almost never a good reason to have two different modules or n different modules on the same page. Because any time you would have always put a particular set of modules on a page, that's an opportunity that the compiler lost to have optimized those modules together into one bigger module. 